So good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, second webinar on the stay-at-home seminars of the ICN2 from the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology from Barcelona. Uh, this afternoon, we have a very interesting panelist. We are going to talk everybody about uh, uh, perovskite solar cell stability, and we have here Professor Eugene Kast also joining me, uh, and, and he will present uh, the, the uh, organizers of this uh, uh, webinar. I'm just here to welcome. I hope to, to have you again in the next webinars that we organize. Uh, just before we start, I remind you that in the bottom, you will have an a, a icon that it says Q&A. If you have any questions during the session of at the end, please do it there and the, the, the chair will read the questions after the talks, okay? Uh, Eugene, thank you for being here, and I leave you with Eugene. Thank you very much for, for being with us. Thanks, Monica. I'm happy to be in Barcelona again. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. We will talk today about uh, problems of stability in perovskite photovoltaics and also problem of testing, about agreement how to do it. And during the last years, we work on the uh, activity which will, which finished with uh, publishing a paper in Nature Energy on a consensus of this question. And it all comes from our joint work uh, by Cost uh, Association, which uh, Monica led. And uh, in 2010, Professor Frederick Krebs did the following job for organic photovoltaics, so uh, during one of the conferences, so it's called ISAS conference, it was a round table discussion and we agreed, and Monica and me was among the causes of this first original uh, so-called ISOS protocols, which we uh, want to keep, but we understand also, recognize that we need something new for perovskite photovoltaics, something special. What does this ISOS protocols mean? It's not a um, qualification test standards. It's uh, some kind of academical standards to understand the degradation mechanism, what factor is important, what the device architecture or stress factor, etc., etc. And uh, all uh, speakers today were among the most active uh, uh, authors of uh, this uh, of this paper. And uh, of course, Mark was uh, professor, <coughs> oh, not professor, doctor, still future. Uh, Dr. Mark Henkin was a first co-author and he did a huge job working in my lab. He was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab for, for three years. Uh, so I, I, I would like to, to suggest uh, he, he start this and uh, good luck to everyone, every, every speaker and thanks for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot. I guess now you can hear my uh, my voice and see my screen, right? Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mark. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And let me break down for you this uh, consensus statement Eugene was talking about right now. Yay. I guess you all recognize the graph to the left, which highlights what a tremendous progress has been achieved recently on the last 10 years in the efficiency of the perovskite solar cells. What is less advertised in the field though is how much have been achieved in stability. And if you think about it, it's been really a lot of progress. We started with several minutes, barely enough to measure the efficiency of a device. And now we are somewhere with more than 1000 hours under constant sunlight illumination, etc. This is great. But the difference in achievement and stability and efficiency is that efficiency is already compatible and stability is really, really far below what we want it to be. So more and more researchers are now going to the stability and they realize that studying stability is somehow more problematic compared to studying efficiency. Not only it takes like much longer time, but also efficiency is being measured under standard test conditions and we all know what efficiency stands for. Well, stability is more a generic word for like a couple of dozens of different experiments. And then the lifetime is also not so well defined and a little bit open to interpretation. 
So when you're designing the stability experiment in the home, where would you go to? The go-to place for the whole PV industry would be IC standards, like the IC 61215, the qualification and type approval, which is a set of stress tests, or a sequence rather of stress tests, and some pass-fail criteria. So if you go through it and lose less than a certain amount of efficiency, then you can sell your solar module on the market. But then this works really, really well, but it works well only because everyone uh, who've been constructed those IC standards knew the degradation modes active in those devices. And when some new device enters or like some modification of the old device enters, some new degradation has been discovered and those standards being revisited and updated and changed. With perovskite solar cells, we are not quite on this level. We don't really know enough to do that. So what we need to do is to go to the uh, cell, individual cell level, or even not back to a material level and understand what kind of degradation goes in there. And in order to assist these kind of uh, studies, we still need to introduce a little bit of a common ground between the researchers. We still need some standardized conditions, even though they are not standards. They're just uh, recommendations on how to make it uniform between different research groups. And this is where this ISOS protocol solution talked about steps in. The first set of ISOS protocols was introduced by OPV community back in 2011 uh, for organic photovoltaics. And then uh, recently, last year, we've been also uh, We've been also revisiting it in order to understand whether there is something special about them for perovskite TV as well. And uh, today we have kind of an interesting seminar with five co-authors reporting in a short talk on different aspects of that. And I'm going to break down what this consensus statement has inside. So, of course, it's all about the environmental factors which can be uh, encountered by a solar cell device in the natural environment and which has a high potential to degrade the solar cell. It's not that many, but you can apply them each at different level of intensity, and then you can combine them, and then you can cycle them, and it brings roughly infinite amount of different degradation protocols which you can do. ISOS helps to put a system on it. So ISOS introduces five different families of experiment, and they are being abbreviated with one letter, as a D for dark storage and L for light soaking. There are outdoor experiments, thermal cycling, and quite complex light humidity thermal cycling. From these uh, families, outdoor is, of course, standalone kind of thing uh, because it's most wanted. It's what in reality happens to the solar module, and this is what truly important for everyone. But it's also very difficult to work with on the research level because conditions are always different. The rest of the tests or most of the other tests are somehow accelerated uh, compared to what you see in the outdoor. And I believe Professor Kettle will uh, talk about it in his contribution today. When each of these families has three different levels of sophistication or like how much equipment do you need, but also levels one, two, and three highlight the increase in how harsh is the test. I will uh, illustrate it on the dark storage tests. So on the level one, on D1 level, you would have ambient atmosphere and ambient temperature, which are monitored but not controlled specifically. And then on the second level, you introduce a hot plate or some means of heating up the sample. And on the D3, you control both high temperature and high humidity, and you end up with some kind of a dump heat or 85-85 test. And the similar logic you can translate to the other testing families, like this one with light soaking. And we use the same logic when we were introducing a bit of a new protocols, which are spe special for perovskite PE. So what's that special about perovskite? Uh, why do we think that there is some kind of a need to update what we, are, what we have for OPV? First of all, not about the protocols of aging or stress factors, but rather about how to measure them. Perovskite devices are known to be uh, to have those slow transient processes, to have hysteresis on the JV measurement. So the procedure in which we do the measurement should be updated and revisited. And in this context, MPP tracking becomes more and more important, more and more <laughs> laboratories use it. And uh, 
if you want to certify your cell or something like that, five minutes of MPP tracking will come in. So for stability measurements, we also rely more and more on MPP, not only because we want to have traces of efficiency, but also because MPP is the most natural biasing condition, and bias condition does matter for the lifetime that you measure. Another effect which is uh, particular for perovskites, it's not unique for perovskites, but it's very pronounced, is that many degradation processes are actually reversible. So when a cell degrades and you remove the stress, it can recover back. And then the results of cycled experiments and results of experiments with constantly applied stress are very different even qualitatively. I mean, don't get me wrong, both non-reversible and reversible processes are bad for a solar cell and we would love to get rid of all of them. But separating between reversible and non-reversible processes is really helpful for the research. And then another thing which is important is to keep track of the uh, stability of your solar cell under applied bias. Both positive, which is the natural uh, condition for a solar cell, or negative, which also can happen. <laughs> If you connect uh, multiple solar cells into the module and then one of those cells is got shaded by the tree or cloud or whatever, it might be forced to operate under the negative bias condition and it could be very detrimental for the stability. So on the protocol level, it means that we updated them and add two new families in here. Uh, one is with uh, light darkness cycling and one is with uh, positive or negative bias application in the dark. The most important thing discussed when you are doing stability or designing stability experiments is the impact of water and uh, oxygen. And in, uh, in this sense, there are different approaches. There are debates about what is the best approach. To me, they are not contradicting to each other, but they are complementing each other. So that, um, one of the approaches is to encapsulate the devices, like the real solar cells are, and then put them into a humid or ambient atmosphere and study stability. And Ron today will talk more about this approach. The other approach would be do not encapsulate and try to do the device which is stable in the ambient even without encapsulation. And the third one is to go to someone less realistic thing with inert atmosphere. But at the same time, on a research level, it is very useful because it can help us to separate different degradation factors from each other. And uh, about this, Conrad Damansky will share with us his experience in working with uh, intrinsic stability a bit later, I think right after me. So from a protocol point of view, those inert atmosphere experiments should be included now, especially because more and more groups have such capability to do, to run stability tests in the glove box or nitrogen field uh, sample holders or something. They are marked with, uh, with the index I over here and that stands for changing the atmosphere from ambient to the inner one. Many co-authors of this uh, uh, consensus statement think and consider that the most important part is to release some kind of a reporting checklist. So that's a list of different uh, details of the stability experiment, which can be crucial, which are very important. And it, as you can see on the slide, it's a very long list. It's very easy to break it down, but the devil is in details. And the, uh, like, what is the spectrum of your light source? Whether you have UV or don't have UV? What's the uh, bias condition? Was you, did you track the maximum power point or not? What was the algorithm of that tracking, etc.? But this is important and this is uh, uh, really needed when we want to reach the comparability. But in a nutshell, you need to report the initial uh, parameters of your solar cell, the device layout and the efficiency, what was the packaging, or like what was the encapsulation, uh, what was the aging condition, how long did you cap to them, and what is the statistics which you have collected on the different solar cells. This is where it gets tricky or this is where it gets expensive. Perovskite solar cells are not particularly known to be well reproducible, even if you produce the devices with the same procedure. So getting statistics is important. On the other hand, it is, um, it is equipment consuming to do st statistical studies on this regard. And uh, it could be expensive and not too many labs in the world have a capability to do so. There is no really easy way to get around it, but one way which is available for us nowadays is to collaborate between each other. 
Professor Brunetti would talk later on about uh, round robin type of experiments and uh, what can be extracted out of that. But also, I would like to share with you some achievements which have been done in Helmholtz Central Berlin in the group of Professor Antonio Abate. Uh, guys designed this uh, agent chamber which is capable of tracing many, many, many devices at the same time. And since the group is very open to collaboration, if you have your great device stacks, which you want to test on the stability, do not hesitate to contact these two guys whose emails you see on here. This is a collaboration, of course, it's free of charge. The last thing I, wa I want to talk about is uh, what is actually the result which we get out of our stability experiment. And the result is normally represented as a time evolution of a device efficiency, or time evolution of all the device PV parameters. And as far as, far as it, the comparison go inside one work, you can just put them on top of each other and compare, and you're going to be fine. And then if you want to compare it between different labs, between different device designs, etc., it would be so much more comfortable to work with one number, something which we would call lifetime. There is no consensus of what this number is, but the most typical thing is to use the number which is called T80, or the time it takes for the device efficiency to decrease by 20% from the initial level. Now, to make it more difficult, it, it really depends on the shape, uh, the, the time you measure, it depends on the shape of this time evolution of PCE. And there are different approaches how you can calculate T80. Those approaches account a little bit on our knowledge or prior knowledge on the shape, whether you have burn in or not, whether you have this uh, initial starting growing uh, phase or not. And there is no uh, consensus about this is the right way to do that. So uh, the idea is that we need to report very clearly what was the lifetime uh, which we are reporting. And especially if it hasn't been measured long enough to get it to the TAT, let's say it took too long to degrade the device so the experiment stopped earlier, and it could be extrapolated, but then it should be clearly distinguished between extrapolated results and those which are um, actually measured. So I hope I make it a little bit more clear uh, to you what is this consensus paper containing. And uh, one thing I didn't stop by in particular is but the, the purpose of this is, of course, to get more reproducible results and more easily uh, comparable results if we all use similar procedures. And uh, in particular, it can allow us uh, to accumulate enough data to start some data-driven approaches. So there is some kind of a template which you can use if you want, and you can download it from the journal website. Uh, if you want to report the data and you think that people can use it for machine learning, it will be very beneficial if you use the same standard. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope I'm still in time. This is a uh, okay. Yeah. So let's thank uh, for Mark uh, for his uh, nice talk. Uh, let's say um, there is a one question about uh, your presentation. So here is uh, there is a beginner. Uh, he asked, uh, like, uh, please uh, briefly uh, highlight the testing method and the tools used for stability. Yeah, well, the testing method depends on the tools available. Uh, the, the, the most common experiment which is present, currently presented in literature is to test it in the dark. So you just uh, leave your device in the dark, whether on shelf or uh, on the hot plate or in the humidity chamber and periodically measure efficiency of a device. However, it's moving more and more towards now uh, having semi-standard measurement of stability, which is light stability. So you need to place your solar cell under the sun simulator and then keep tracing the, device, the evolution of P PCE and then use some kind of figure of merit to say what have happened to it. 
Okay, let's thank again uh, for Mark's talk. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Conrad uh, Domaski. Uh, Domaski. So let's welcome Domaski to uh, give us the talk. Okay, um, Mark, you need to stop sharing your screen so that I can share mine. Okay, yeah. So, sorry. Okay, um, can everyone see and hear it? So, welcome, my name is Konrad Domanski and I will talk today about the new approaches to understanding stability of perovskite solar cells. So I often like to start with this analogy how research into photovoltaics in general is a little bit like climbing Matterhorn, the Tolerone mountain in the Swiss Alps. And when you look at this mountain from Zermatt, from this iconic view that you see in the postcards, you see three ways to get the top. Uh, the east face, the Horny Ridge, and the north face. And then the Horny Ridge is a little bit like uh, research into efficiency in perovskite solar cells, in solar cells in general. It is the most obvious one if you want to go up this mountain. It happens to be the easiest one, and historically it was the one that was first climbed. Then on the right, there is the North Face. This is actually the hardest of all routes up this mountain. Um, it is a little bit like stability uh, in photovoltaics. Uh, once the efficiency was achieved, once the Hurley Ridge was uh, climbed, the North Face was the big challenge that everyone had their eyes on. It was eventually climbed um, at the beginning of 20th century. I think as the perovskite solar cell community, we're still making progress up this well. And then on the left, in a shadow, there is the East Face. It's also a very hard technical route, uh, but it's neither the, the most obvious one to go, neither the most difficult and hence the biggest price. And because of that, it gets a little bit overlooked and it doesn't get many climbs. And in our analogy of solar cell research has to be climbed down, which makes it an additional challenge. But if you could freeze the conditions of the, on the mountain during the day you climb, as you go up, you would see them differ very much. You start with moderate temperatures, uh, a little bit of UV light and wind, but as you get higher, the conditions get fiercer, you, you get freezing temperatures, you get a lot of UV light, the wind starts bashing you, and then as you go down, it goes again a little bit milder. And it's a little bit what the solar cell experiences during a day, starting in mild conditions in the morning, going for the high illumination, high um, temperature phase in the, in the middle of the day, and then in the evening going back. But at the end of the day, what we care about is the energy yields. So with that in mind, we ask ourselves questions. How perovskite solar cells perform under different temperature and illumination conditions? Uh, how well do they work in the field? Uh, how does it compare to the market leader silicon? And are they good much for a tandem? And we built a setup at EPFL where we could control uh, load in the device, temperature, illumination, and uh, cycle the conditions. And we used our workhorse device of cesium, metal ammonium, fluoramidemium, and then iodine bromide perovskite, the triple cation. Uh, because it was very reproducible and could give us good room temperature stability. And we did all these experiments under, uh, on non-encapsulated cells in inert nitrogen atmosphere. And Mark already started talking a little bit, uh, quite a lot. Uh, but um, one of our motivations uh, to doing that is that it's not easy to know, um, not very intuitive, how perovskite solar cells will behave. We see that under continuous uh, light exposure, we, we get this behavior where we leave it in the dark, that the cell uh, will recover part of its uh, loss performance. We see that they will behave completely differently when we cycle the illumination. We also see that at different temperatures, the cell will behave differently, whether it's minus 10 cold winter morning or 65 on a sweltering summer afternoon, and then also cycling between those conditions. 
we know that uh, different atmospheres uh, impact the un unencapsulated cells um, very differently and uh, quite catastrophically in some cases. And that will tell us how well we need to encapsulate them. And finally, we, we know that the load on a device can play a crucial role, whether we have it in maximum power point, short circuit, open circuit, what Mark said also about the reverse bias is very important. If we have any shadow on our solar cell module and one cell is shaded, that cell will be driven into reverse bias and absolutely destroyed from what we know so far, not for encouraging. So with those questions in mind, we designed an experiment where we tested uh, perovskite and silicon heterojunction cells across a parameter space of uh, different temperatures and line intensities. So we look here at different temperatures and line intensities, how the cells behave. And we see that for silicon, uh, we operate, when we operate them at low temperature and high line intensities, that's where we get the best performance. For perovskites, we don't see the very much trend with temperature, but definitely it's better at higher line intensities. Then we, if we look at the maximum power point, which is where our cells would you know, naturally stay, we see that the trends in voltage, both for silicon and perovskite, follow the same trend as for efficiency. While for current, we have a much uh, more subtle trend, but both get better at the lower light intensities, of course, normalized for amount of light incident. And the fact that they behave in a similar manner is important uh, because um, many people would argue that the, the path of least resistance to the market for perovskites is to marry them with silicon in a two-terminal tandem. And it's important that they behave similarly, at least for current, that they behave similarly across um, temperature and illumination space. So that once you match the currents of your two sub um, subcells, that your tandem device remains matched. Uh, so for, for temperature, we saw for silicon that we have a negative thermal coefficient. This is something that is very well known from the literature. For perovskites, we didn't find uh, one, which is probably a good thing because we would, if anything, we would um, um, expect it to be negative. Uh, so with that knowledge of how our devices um, behave at different conditions, we took uh, two most extreme days uh, from each month of a year, um, 2016, 2017, from a weather station near Lausanne in Switzerland. And here you see we plotted temperature and intensity across this kind of accelerated one year experiment where we have the two most extreme days from each month. And we exposed um, our devices to the same, to those conditions. So what we did, we mounted both devices in the same holder, perovskites and, and silicon. Uh, and we, we, in our setup, we could um, keep them in inner atmosphere, atmosphere and emulate light and temperature variations. So for silicon, we see here how they perform, that's the efficiency over the course of the experiment. We see that every day in the middle, there is a small dip, that's where the device gets hot. For perovskites, the shape is a little bit different. We see it's best in the morning and then it gets a bit worse towards the evening. And we also see a systematic drive to the, to the lower end of the scale, which means we have some degradation. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Very quickly, this is the incident energy distribution over the 24 days. This is how temperature and uh, line intensity. And we look how much energy was incident on our device and across the space. So we see that the most energy is incident at temperatures around 30, 40 degrees and high line intensities. Um, for silicon, uh, this is how it performed across this parameter space. Uh, so again, we have temperature and line intensity. And we see that the silicon solar cell was most efficient in this bottom left corner, which is a bit of a loss opportunity because most of the energy is produced here, where it's less efficient. For perovskites, uh, the thing is uh, the, the landscape looks a little bit better. Uh, they are efficient right where we produce most, most energy. So that's a positive message. Then the next thing we looked into was um, how much energy we produced and what we were expecting. So because we did this pre-characterization across this um, intensity temperature space, we knew exactly how the cell should react to 
to our routine with different temperatures and light. And that's exactly what I'm plotting here at the bottom. In the blue, you see uh, the difference from the expected energy harvested. In the black, you see how much energy was harvested. For silicon, you see it's a little bit noisy, goes up, so it goes down, there is no clear trend. For perovskite, we see that there's a clear trend uh, with our expectations uh, missing the, sorry, with the reality missing our expectations by more and more as we progress into experiment. So that tells us there must be degradation. And if we try to quantify these things, uh, we see uh, these numbers. Uh, 21.3 versus 19.5, this was the, um, the, these were the values uh, measured at the beginning of the experiment for those two devices under standard test conditions. Uh, this is uh, what we would predict uh, from, uh, from, again, from this matrix, what, from our knowledge, what we know. This is how much energy was incident, that's how much they produced, and this is how, how efficient they were effectively. So 21.5 versus 17.7. .7. And we see that um, silicon uh, is very close, the, the, the energy it produced is very close to what you would expect from pre-characterizing it. So standard testing conditions are actually very accurate to predict the energy yield of silicon heterojunction, at least when you test those devices in the kind of moderate climate of Western Europe. For perovskites, we see that we are missing 10%. And if we, um, if we make the comparison against the predicted efficiency, so not against the standard test condition, but against predicted one, and again, the prediction is based on this matrix, we get even closer for silicon, and we see a full 10% um, loss to degradation for perovskites across 24 days. So let's look at one uh, day. Um, here in the, the solid line is how much energy, or actually how efficient we were during the day for both perovskite and silicon. And the blue line is what was predicted, again, from our matrix of pre-characterization across different temperatures and line densities. So we see that for perovskites, as the day progresses, we develop this discrepancy between prediction and the reality. Uh, and we also see that at the morning, this, those two curves get close. For silicon, on the other hand, we see that in the middle of the day, it gets hot and it gets less efficient. And we see here, for example, that the reaction to, to change this temperature is very directly related and almost instantaneous. So we started quantifying the degradation for perovskites. And because, again, these curves get pretty close to each other in the morning, we can see how much of this degradation was recovered overnight. So we start with like around 5% reversible degradation and no irreversible degradation, of course, at the beginning of our experiment. And as we progress, we accumulate more and more irreversible degradation. So with that, let me um, give my first set of conclusions. We investigated perovskite solar cells under real operating conditions simulating the lab avoiding all the parasitic um, effects associated with doing this test outdoor. Uh, we compared energy yields uh, of perovskite and silicon heterojunction. We found little temperature dependence for perovskites, uh, unlike for silicon. And we um, see that perovskite and silicon heterojunction are good performanolytic tandems because once you match your currents, the currents remain matched. And then finally, we observe reversible and irreversible degradation for perovskite solar cells. And what Mark was already telling, we are converging on a way to measure stability. And that's, um, um, that's a little bit on my second part of the talk. So what we did recently in Fluxim, we released two very advanced products for measuring uh, stability of uh, perovskite solar cells, not only perovskite, but uh, solar cells in general. And we designed those instruments uh, with the ISOs protocols in mind. We can stress with LITOS 32 devices at the same time, measure GV curves. We can stress them at maximum power point, constant voltage, constant current. We can control temperature across wide spectrum. We have white and UV illumination up to 10 suns for accelerated testing. We can control atmosphere. And what is uh, really a differentiator for LITOS is we can do uh, extensive institute um, studies while we degrade the devices. We not only have a spectrometer in integrated inside, 
each, each of those chambers, but also you can connect Vitos to our other instrument, PIOS. And PIOS is a very powerful platform to measure all sorts of transient AC and DC characteristics of optoelectronic devices. In Litos, you can measure with PIOS each of the 32 devices you have in your chamber. So for example, you can do four hours of maximum PowerPoint tracking for all devices and then measure impedance spectroscopy for each of them or silly for TPV or TPC. So this gives you a very powerful platform to understand and to see much beyond the simple uh, efficiency versus time curve. And what we are working on right now is to exploit this uh, massive capability and to combine it with simulations that were actually our alma mater in Fluxim is, that's where we come from. Uh, you can stress your devices with LITOS, measure them periodically with PIOS, and do simulations with our drift diffusion simulation software SETMOS to understand the the, the measurements you did. You can fit your data with unique set of parameters such as charge mobilities or electrical barriers and interfaces. And that lets you uh, to really understand what is degrading your device and what we call it the Lito cycle. And then finally, we even more recently, just last month, we released a new product. Uh, it's called Litos Light. Uh, it's not that much a light version of Litos, but a standalone instrument where over LITOS, uh, we can integrate an external illumination such as solar simulator and measure uh, stability and JV curves um, with beyond triple A illumination, tune the spectrum, can adjust the intensity and we can have everything fully integrated in our software. So with that, I would like to help our dedicated team at Fluxim as well as my collaborators at EPFL during my PhD times and of course, you for attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, let's thank Mark for his nice talk. So there is, right now there is one question about uh, the environmental impact. Some people uh, ask which part of the my, uh, my home is the environmental impact? Huh. Uh, I think as you climb to the top, the, the, it starts impacting you more and more. Um, I'm not sure how to extend that analogy further into the environmental impact, but what I know for sure is that the conditions uh, during the day will vary quite drastically, and that's what you would also face when you climb a mountain like that. Okay. Another question uh, is the degradation is occurring and the perovskite material itself in your studies or not? Or so occurring you, because of the, okay, let's repeat uh, it again. So the, the degradation is occurring and the perovskite material itself in your studies or not? Or occurring because of the interface layers or how do you know it and always uh, to how to improve it, something, yeah. So that's a very complex question and it depends heavily on at which temperature you look, at which um, atmosphere you look, at which bias you look. Um, in terms of the experiment under the, the simulation of weather conditions, we have a great deal of reversible degradation, which we have very good indication is coming from the ionic movement, from a small movement of cations on the time scale of, of hours. Uh, this is mostly recoverable. But if you look at the data, we also hit temperatures above 50 degrees. Uh, we know from our own experience that at those temperatures, some of the interfaces can become instable. Uh, for example, gold can attack the spiro omitad layer and destroy the, the perovskite, I mean, destroy both the, the HCM and perovskite layer. And of course, we have definitely we have some trace gases in our environment. There will be oxygen, there will be water, it's unavoidable, even under, under um, inert environment. So there is definitely also a part of chemical degradation that we see. Okay, another inter interesting question is, how do we differentiate electronic and ironic currents? 
So I'm, I am how, not how sure to, if that is yeah. really a, a big question for stability testing. What we are trying to do, as I, I mentioned already a little bit in my advertising part of the talk, if you like it, we try to do um, periodically in situ measurements um, to try to differentiate the, the different mechanisms. Because of course, what you normally see is you see your device is degrading. You can measure maybe GV curves to get a little bit of extra insight. You know, maybe this is because of JSC and not because of VOC. But you're still left with many possible explanations for the effects you observe. So what you can do is to do, for example, AC experiments. You can do impedance spectroscopy or IMPS. Um, people use that to, to see ionic movement. And we can do it ourselves um, periodically during our degradation studies to see how different dynamics are changing in a device as it degrades. Yeah, some, some people also asking um, if your um, techniques is capable of measuring tandem devices or just only single junction. Yes, of course it is. Um, for, for that, for tandems, one of the big considerations is have to have the right uh, light spectrum. And this is a big challenge for stability testing in general because you don't necessarily always want to buy an expensive solar simulator to do uh, stability studies. And if you use just white or maybe white plus UV light, you will not get the right spectrum for testing your tandems unless you really optimize your tandem for that specific um, illumination source. So with Litos Light, we offer a solution uh, where we measure under AAA solar simulator. We, we found a really good solutions uh, which are affordable for uh, stability studies. And that's our solution for tandems right now. Very well. Uh, the last question, let's say, um, there is one, one people uh, asking, uh, as Paris guys seem to decay over time uh, during each run, so how did you deconvolute the temperature best degradation from the time best degradation? So, you know, in, in our experiment, that was not really the point to, to decouple those things. The, the point was actually the opposite, to, to couple everything together and see how it behaves under realistic conditions. We've done a, a great deal of experiments under um, under where, where we would fix most of the experimental conditions like illumination and atmosphere and we would just look at how different temperatures uh, impact the, the cells and we see of course very big variation especially as we go to higher temperatures we activate different degradation modes but in this particular study the, um, the point was exactly the opposite to couple all the effects together and see how realistically the cells behave while at the same time avoiding all the parasitic, parasitic um, effects such as illumination problem, sorry, the encapsulation problems uh, when we go and do those tests outside. Good. Okay, so I think uh, the time is limited. So let's thank um, Conrad again for his nice talk. Okay. And there is a lot of questions uh, coming. If you have to say, then uh, let's move to another talk. Uh, the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Ron Ron. Uh, 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 guys or ourselves. Uh, let's welcome uh, Ron Ron, Dr. Ron Ron. Hi everyone, I'm Rong Rong Jajaran. Today I will talk about uh, encapsulating perovskite solar cells towards a 25 years lifetime. We all know that um, perovskite solar cells are promising with their efficiency reaching commercial technology. However, stability of perovskite has been a bottleneck with utilization. Because perovskite are known to degrade in all kinds of these environmental stressors and most efforts uh, stabilize perovskite intrinsically against light, heat, and moisture that lots of time trade off with mechanical stability, which 
is crucial during day and night cycling in field operation. Today, I'll show you how I overcame these stability challenges by designing a robust encapsulation to protect the perovskite solar cells and these environmental stressors. Let me first show you the big result of my talk, that my holistic package enabled perovskite cells to pass three critical IEC standard tests, as Mark might have mentioned, which demonstrate the potential for perovskite to reach the desirable 25 years lifetime. To pass the IEC test, the cells need to show no visual degradation and retain more than 95% of the initial performance, as seen by the y-axis here. High performance of each solar cell in different line color through different period of testing. My package enabled perovskite to pass uh, through a thermal cycling between negative 40 Celsius to 85 degrees Celsius, 1,000 hours of damp heat tests, between 85C and 85% relative humidity, and 15 kilowatt hours per meter square of UV exposure. For the rest of my talk, I will touch on important design parameters of the package that enable the perovskite solar cell to pass each of these IEC tests. This is the perovskite cell stack used for stability testing developed by Kevin Bush in McGee Group which can produce up to 23.6% when put in monolithic tandem with silicon. The two layers that enhance thermal stability, the mixed uh, CSFA cation and ITO, which both minimize the volatilization during the prolonged aging and enable encapsulation process at 140 uh, Celsius for 20 minutes. However, without encapsulation, the device degraded as seen by the, vi uh, the visible degradation to yellow lead iodide. After 250 thermocycling and 250 hours of damp heat tests. Therefore, I designed this package to prevent degradation caused by all three stressors mentioned earlier. When thinking of encapsulation, there are four components that need to be considered during packaging assembly the external barrier, the edge seal, buffer, and the feed through. In our case, we made multiple necessary modification from the original glass glass packaging proven to enable 25 years lifetime in silicon cell to encapsulate perovskite. First, I'll focus on designing for mechanical robustness, which involves a careful selection of the encapsulant to not only hold all the components inside the package together, but also prevent cracking or delamination during thermal cycling. There are two reasons why mechanical stability is a concern for perovskite cells. On the lot of fracture energy, the lower the fracture energy, the easier it is to break the materials. And we can see here, perovskite active layer has the lowest fracture energy compared to silicon and organic cells. Uh, so that's kind of scary. Not only are we concerned about how easy it is to break within a single layer, but also the mismatches in thermal expansion coefficient that can cause the adjacent layers to come apart or referred to as delamination uh, during thermal cycling. On the right shows thermal expansion coefficient values of each layer which expand over two order of magnitudes from four to 200 as shown in the parentheses. There are multiple places where delamination can occur. So um, yeah, so it's kind of scary still. Since perovskite device is mechanically uh, fragile, we need to carefully design the encapsulant surrounding it for a mechanical support. Let's first look at how having an encapsulant can improve the fracture energy of the perovskite device. This graph shows fracture energy in y-axis of perovskite device with and without encapsulation. We found that PCBM is the layer where fracture occur for all device configuration, requiring only 0.2 joule per meter square to pull apart. Just to give you a comparison, I can just, I can just push a scotch tape and peel the perovskite apart that easily. Uh, so we then introduce a physical extra layer of encapsulant on top, either the EVA and Serlin. We found that in both cases, the fracture energy increased four times. 
from this, we learned that the absorbed strain that would otherwise delaminate the perovskite. So even though adding a layer of encapsulant makes it harder to fracture through a perovskite solar cell, if this layer is not compliant enough to absorb strain due to thermal expansion, expansion coefficient mismatch during thermal cycling, it can lead to delamination. Shown here are pictures of solar cells encapsulated and serline after tuned thermal cycle as shown above. We see no sign of delamination of solar cell encapsulated in EVA. That is because EVA is compliant with an elastic modulus of 10 megapascal and it can absorb mismatch strain dur uh, during thermal cycling. However, there is a delamination for solar cell encapsulated in serline, which has 40 times higher elastic modulus than EVA, as shown by a rainbow fringes and a lot current measured by laser beam in this current. Choosing a low elastic modulus is only one aspect for encapsulant. There are other properties to consider, such as chemical reactivity, which is one of many design requirements to pass the most aggressive standard that he tests at 85C and 85% relative humidity. We can see here, heat can cause between species, metal getting in degrading perovskite and iodide leaving perovskite reacting with metal. Both heat and metal can cause chemical decomposition of perovskite releasing volatile species. Let's first continue finding the right encapsulant that doesn't chemically react with perovskite. Since the then heat test requires a thousand hours, I instead use an even more accelerated condition to screen for encapsulant. This pressure cooker uh, gives me a condition at 120 C, 100% relative humidity, that can uh, give result within 20 hours. Here are pictures of solar cells encapsulated in three most commonly used encapsulant, EVA, serlin, and polyolefin, after 20 hours of aging in a pressure cooker. The rectangular box in the middle bottom is where the perovskite is covered with ITO. Even though EVA is desirable due to elastic modulus to pass temperature cycling, there is a chemical reaction between acidic acid in EVA and perovskite, which results in yellow lines shown in the picture, making it undesirable for perovskite. Uh, Serlin, therefore, we see with, with high, uh, 40 times higher elastic modulus, therefore, we see a delamination of this device as well. While for polyolefin with the similar elastic modulus to EVA, so should promote the mechanical robustness. Moreover, there is no sign of uh, perovskite degradation with uh, polyolefin. And looking at this table below, there are also many other properties um, for encapsulant. Therefore, we chose polyolefin for our package. So with all the components together, our simple package design that stabilizes perovskite cells in three IC tests includes first a compliant encapsulant for mechanical robustness during temperature cycling, second a chemically inert encapsulant as I just showed you polyolefin, glass and edge seal to protect moisture from getting in and decompose the perovskite, and then on substrate electrical feed through instead of a solar ribbon to minimize the moisture ingress that could otherwise get inside the package through a thick ribbon or trap inside due to of the component during the lamination. As you can see here, this is my previous package design with movement and moisture trap inside the package. Then we would like to have no vertical overlap between metal and perovskite to prevent the known metal-induced perovskite degradation. This graph shows a normalized JSC in purple and normalized PC in pink of non-encapsulate solar cells after a thousand hours aging 85C in nitrogen. We can see that solar cells with metal electrode, silver, copper, and gold, despite having ITO contact in between uh, metal and perovskite, still degrade, while the cells without metal doesn't degrade. And the metal degradation can be seen in this picture. 
This is due to the trenches in ITO films as shown in a cross-section SEM on the left, where metal and iodide can diffuse and degrade the perovskite. If we properly planalize the perovskite track on the right to get a dense ITO, we can enable even thermally unstable mappy solar cell with ITO and uh, silver on top to survive the 85C for a thousand hours. This shows that uh, when designing uh, electrical feed through, we need to either separate the metal from perovskite or develop a dense barrier between the perovskite and the metal electrode for stability. With all these disasters, the encapsulated perovskite cell shows no visual degradation as well as not degrading more than 5% after 1,000 hours in damp heat. Therefore, pass the IEC damp heat test. And you can see the uh, before and after damp heat test on the picture on the right with no yellow lead iodide. Lastly, with our device stack and package to prevent environmental species from getting in, our package also enable the perovskite cells to pass the exposure test that shine the UV for um, 15 kilowatt hours at 55 degrees Celsius. This is inside the package, by the way. So in conclusion, I developed one simple encapsulation design that can stabilize perovskite solar cells against the crucial environmental stressors and pass the three IC standardized tests all together. One can easily implement this technique for outdoor testing following the consensus statement as Mark has mentioned and shown here below, which will bring us realistic perspective of perovskite solar cells in real world operation. Thank you, Mickey Group, for opportunities to carry out the work. Here, the picture of our package in the stability review and our encapsulation paper. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you uh, want to collaborate or join our team. Currently, have a PhD open. Lastly, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Ron. Very insightful talk. Thanks a lot. One general comment that, uh, about the questions coming up. Uh, please use the question and answer um, button below your screen to, uh, to ask the questions. And it is okay if a question comes a, bit, a little bit late. The panel members can uh, type in their answers. And alternatively, if we have too many, we can answer later on in written and post it on the ICN2 website. So uh, right now, let, let's jump into the questions to you, Ron, which are already yes. in here. One question asks, uh, what is the perovskite thickness in your devices and whether you know or not if perovskite thickness affect mechanical stability? Um, so the perovskite thickness we use are 500 nanometer. Um, we try, uh, so together with the Dowskite group at Stanford, we did try different perovskite. And as I mentioned before, um, the mechanical weakness comes from the PCBM layer instead of perovskite. Okay. So uh, there, there, there is a general question about your vision on, uh, on the encapsulation process. <laughs> what do you think would be the encapsulation technology which will come? And I, I assume that the uh, question is which come, you know, uh, in, in the industry. Well, I mean, if you want to put perovskite out right away, like this year or next year, I think you will still need to go for a rigid glass glass encapsulation. But uh, if people want to go for flexible um, perovskite perovskite tandem, and they, you know, if they want to use flexible, then I think the flexible encapsulation still needs some time to reach the rigid encapsulation. Probably. Like, like a year or something. You're optimistic, good. <laughs> There's another question asking specifically about oxygen uh, uh, transmission rates. If you know uh, what is the best encapsulant for uh, preventing oxygen to get into? Mm, I think the value for oxygen transmission is also reported for um, PIB, the, the, uh, the 
beauty rubber that I use in my packages. Um, I need to see my slide. Uh, I don't know it on top of my head, but um, the group at NREL, Mike Tempe, did a lot of uh, experiment with this materials. Okay, so we will check supporting information in, uh, in your papers for oxygen transmission rate. Yeah. And um, the questions uh, coming are mostly interested about like how to upscale, how to transmit your procedure from uh -huh. the laboratory devices to the industrial scale. Uh, can you comment maybe on like whether you can have um, a little bit less wide encapsulant layer and, and like barrier uh -huh. layer on the edges or how do you see translation to the industry? So first, first thing, um, the reason why we chose 15 millimeter uh, wide of the edge seal is also from Mike Kempe paper when he was doing his silicon work that 15 millimeter should be uh, sufficient to delay water for 25 years. So yeah, it's, it's a little wide for the package as we see here, but when you talk about like, you know, like 14 watt, uh, 40 watts um, module, uh, 15 millimeter is definitely really small. And another thing is the um, laminator I use, uh, actually just normal commercial laminator. So I think you just put the Etsy around, put the encapsulant and the glass, and then use a normal uh, industrial processing and then you go to go. You just need to, as, as I say before, you just need to select carefully the four components of the um, uh, package. Okay, it, the topic is really is really hot. We can we are we are receiving more specific questions, and I suggest that you uh, at least can answer some of them in the uh, chat mode, uh, and okay. we have to keep this concise and not to go over our time scale. Yeah. Uh, move on to the next talk. Thanks a lot, Ron. It was very interesting. Yeah. And the Thank next you. speaker is Professor Jeff Kettle from Bangor University, who will introduce us a little bit to the outdoor testing and a little bit to the concept of the acceleration factors. Jeff, please, floor is yours. <coughs> Can you hear me okay? Okay, so, um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Jeff Kettle. I'm from the School of Electronic Engineering at Bangor University in the UK. What I'm going to discuss is um, outdoor testing of perovskite solar cells and calculation of acceleration factors. Um, so I'll start here just by discussing reliability engineering and how outdoor testing and acceleration factors fit into um, a reliability test program. Um, so it's a <coughs> So it's important that if you're trying to develop a commercial application of anything that you you actually undertake a number of different processes simultaneously. So you're not really doing um, a, a single process to improve reliability. You're actually doing a number of different processes at the same time. And outdoor testing is one of the processes you'll be doing. But outdoor testing has a number of advantages. Um, it's used firstly for helping to identify unpredictable failure mechanisms or failure mechanisms which are quite difficult to replicate under laboratory conditions. I would say it's a relatively easy to set up test. Um, it's, um, you know, I, I talk about our setup in Bangor. It's, um, it's not particularly costly to set up and it's relatively easy to establish. Outdoor testing also gives you some um, interesting insight into some of the physical characteristics of perovskites, um, stuff like the light cycling changes, um, some of the VOC issues you see at low irradiance levels and, and stuff like temperature coefficient as well. There are some disadvantages with um, outdoor testing. Um, so first of all, it won't stimulate all of the defects. So because of the testing is done at relatively low stress levels, you're not gonna get an exhaustive list of failure modes within your solar cell. So it needs to be done in conjunction with accelerated testing. And also um, it's, 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 a, it's a long and duration test. So, so you have to expect these tests are gonna last weeks or months. So acceleration factors are also used a lot in, in reliability engineering and a good definition of acceleration factor is the ratio of failure rates between your, your elevated stress level and, and normal operational conditions. So they can be obtained from some of the ISOS tests which uh, Mark talked about with some minor modifications um, and they're, they're very closely related to accelerated testing so 
um, with accelerated testing, you're trying to develop a program which stimulates as many defects as possible, and then you can start applying corrective action in order to improve improve the, the stability of your perovskite solar cell. And the whole principle is that you're, you're trying to develop tests which have high acceleration factors so that you can get the, the duration of your test down. So start off talking about uh, outdoor testing. Um, the free tests in the, in the new ISOS consensus standards which pertain to outdoor testing, um, 01, 02 and 03, they're actually relatively similar. The, the main differences between these tests are related to the, um, the, the light source you use. So in 01, we do all of our degradation outdoors, but we do the measurements inside under a solar simulator. For 02, we do the testing in situ, the, 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 the degradation and testing in situ. And 03 is a combination of both approaches. So there's not a great deal of information in the uh, paper about outdoor testing, but certainly a lot of the um, discussions about uh, general perovskite testing that do relate to outdoor testing. Um, so the sort of things I would recommend including into papers um, to, to, to give readers a good idea about your, your outdoor testing procedure would be um, whether the devices were biased at maximum power point or open circuit, <coughs> the, fre <coughs> sorry, the frequency of the maximum power point measurements um, and the conditions of the IV tracers. Um, I think some of the module details are very useful, so, so information on the encapsulation materials, the edge sealants, the wiring feed-throughs to the cells, and the module geometry, all of these things influence the stability, so, so please report them. Um, the climatic conditions are also very important, so people know what sort of stress these solar cells were um, exposed to. And presentation of the data is quite important. So, so we tend to show the degradation curves at a, a particular a, a radiance condition where there's a where's the number of data points. I think within perovskite solar cells, there's going to be some, some uh, interest in terms of identifying the best way of presenting outdoor test data. So our testing setup was, was set up um, around about six or seven years ago. Um, we've tested a wide range of third generation technologies, um, but obviously today I'm going to mostly talk about some of the outdoor perovskite testing. In terms of setting up an outdoor testing um, rig, you, know, you don't require massive sums of funding tried to estimate the costs of setting up an outdoor test, which um, complies with O2 standards. You know, a weather station would be around about 300 pounds, you know, calibrated a radiance sensor you can buy relatively cheaply. You do need an SMU, with, ideally with multiplexer and people like Fluxum or Egnatec in Wales, they can produce very, very good quality systems. Um, so it's not, not a great deal of effort to get, get this set up. Um, we, we've tested some perovskite solar cells to date, and the results I'm going to talk about today were, were, were manufactured by Tristan Watson's group in, in Swansea. Um, and these were inverted cell structures. What we did is just looked at the, the influence of the absorber layer on the performance of the solar cell outdoors. So one of the first things we do when we look at the outdoor performance is we, we look at the diurnal performance, particularly on a, on a sunny day. And shown here is a particularly sunny day in the UK where the irradiance rises up to around about one sun irradiation at midday um, and the module temperature rises up to around about eight degrees above the ambient. So shown here is just a comparison of our, our, our mixed cation module, our MAPI module, uh, benchmarked against a polysilicon solar cell. And you can see we actually get very different performances depending upon whether we have a, a mixed cation or a MAPI active layer. So in the case of our mixed cation device, we see the performance um, reach, a, reach a steady value um, early in the morning, um, and actually it slightly increases over the course of the day, but the MAPI module sees this big dip in efficiency at midday. Now the reason for this is actually, it's probably threefold. First of all, MAPI tends to have a, a, a strong negative temperature coefficient. Uh, MAPI also has reversible degradation issues, and also the, the MAPI modules tend to have much higher series resistance, and you know, that, that has a big influence at the, the higher radiance condition in terms of extracting current out of the device. We can obtain some quite interesting information. Um, temperature coefficient is, is, is one thing we can obtain quite easily. Um, we see very different behavior for both the mixed cation and the MAPI devices. Our mixed cation shows actually some of the most stable temperature coefficients out of any technology we've ever looked at. Um, and conversely, our MAPI module shows some of the worst temperature coefficients out of any technology we've looked at. Um, but one, one additional thing we look at is the ROS coefficient. So the ROS coefficient tells you um, how much the solar cell is heating up a unit of incident irradiation. Um, 
in the case of uh, our, our uh, perovskite solar cells, they don't heat up quite so dramatically as, say, a silicon or an OPV module. So some of these interesting temperature characteristics might not have such a big influence when, when these things move to the, the outdoors. I'm just going to move on and talk about uh, acceleration factors as well, um, acceleration factors and accelerated testing. I think the, the objectives of accelerated testing are fairly, fairly obvious. What we're trying to do is, is test our solar cells uh, beyond the operational, um, operational level. Um, so we're not trying to um, overstress the device which, or, or damage the device. We're just trying to test it so we can resolve the full range of weaknesses in our, in our design and processing of our solar cells. Um, so the objective of accelerated testing is to stimulate as many defects as possible. So we have to be very, very careful with the stress level and the acceleration factor we use. But if the stress level is causing the, the defect rather than the failure mode itself, then we are overstressing the device. In that case, our acceleration factor is too high. And conversely, if we, we're using um, stress levels which are too low, we stop stimulating those defects and we, 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 we start simulating a lot of that failure mode. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, there's a wide range of defects within these solar cells um, and we want to stimulate as many as possible so if we're under stressing it then we have to really increase the acceleration factor so um, you know, when you talk about acceleration factors you have to start going into probability and statistics which is probably not good for a friday afternoon so i'm just going to go over relatively quickly this, this, set, this section um, and just focus on three important um, variables which we use in acceleration factor calculations. Um, so FT is used quite a lot. Um, FT is the probability of failure that your solar cell is going to fail within a particular time interval. And one minus FT is known as the reliability function. And if we're using a, an exponential model, um, we can say that the, the reliability function is equal to the, the exponential of minus lambda t. And lambda is quite an important characteristic within reliability engineering. It's known as the hazard rate. Um, so that really gives us an instantaneous failure rate for, for your solar cell. So I'll just talk about how we calculate acceleration factors for um, high temperature testing. And um, I'll, I'll run through a quick example about how, how we can calculate the acceleration factor for, for some of the ISOS-D tests. Um, so for ISOS-D, ISOS we're, we're doing high temperature testing. Um, and one of the models you can use for that is the Arrhenius model. Um, that's really based upon the principle that chemical reactions tend to increase with increased temperature. Um, this has been modified for reliability engineering, so we can say that the hazard rate of your, 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 your solar cell is equal to the, the exponential of minus Ea divided by Kt, where Ea is your activation energy, um, K is your Boltzmann constant, and T is your temperature. Now, as acceleration factor is the, 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 the ratio of the different hazard rates, we can, we can modify this equation so we can say the acceleration factor is equal to this, uh, this second equation here. Um, in a lot of reliability manuals, you can start digging out values for activation energy for, for optoelectronic opto -electronic and electronic systems. You're, you're looking at something around about 0.5 to 0.8 electron volts. Um, but I'm just going to run through a quick example about how you might calculate that for a perovskite device. So this is a, a good example of some, some test data which, which, which we obtained. Um, it's based upon a temperature testing where we we prepared 20 samples, we subjected them to temperature at 85 degrees for a thousand hours, and we observed 12 failures within, within this sample. And likewise, we did some testing at 65 degrees. Um, we used a larger sample size, which was quite common for lower stress levels. You always want to use more samples for the lower stress levels. It gives you better confidence in your data. Um, and for the lower stress level, we saw six failures. It's probably worth saying how you define a failure, um, and it's really, in some respects, it's up to you. You could define it as a complete catastrophic failure when solar cell stops working. We could define it by a metric such as T80 or, or T50. So what I'm going to do is just run through a, a quick example about how you calculate the acceleration factor at 65 degrees and 85 degrees um, for, for this test data. The first thing you'll do is you, you can calculate the hazard rate at 85 degrees and the hazard rate at 65 degrees. So if we take this equation from uh, two slides back, which relates to the probability of failure to, to lambda, you can then calculate lambda for each individual test. And that comes out at around about six times 10 to the minus four for the 85 degree test and 2.4 uh, times 10 to the minus four for the 65 degree test. We can then calculate the acceleration factor between 65 degrees and 85 degrees 
we get an acceleration factor of around about 2.5. So once we have this, we can then go back and actually calculate the activation energy for our perovskite solar cell um, by using this, this equation, which was on the previous slide. Um, and we can calculate then the, accelerate the, sorry, the activation energy of around about 0.47 electron volts. So once we've got the activation energy, we can then calculate the acceleration factor of these two tests. Um, so if you plug in the numbers, you find that for the 65 degree test, our acceleration factor was nine, and for our 85 degree test, the acceleration factor is around about 22. Um, so once you have this acceleration factor, you can then start making some, some, some other calculations. I mean, this is a good example. You know, we know with an acceleration factor of 22, if we're testing for around about 1,000 hours at 85 degrees, and that's equivalent to around about 22,000 hours at 25 degrees. So we get an idea about how much we're simulating relative to outdoor conditions. I'm just going to skip over this slide because I think I'm a little bit rushed for time. Um, but you know, within the handbooks, within the reliability handbooks, you can get activation energies. But you know, I really recommend people always try to calculate the activation energies for their, their own solar cells because um, small adjustments in activation energy can actually have a, a large influence on your perceived acceleration factor. Um, so high temperature testing is, is, is one type of test you might want to do. Um, there's obviously a number of tests in the, in the ISOS uh, consensus standards. Damp heat testing is quite important. Um, so we tend to use uh, a corrosion model. There's, there's a number of different uh, damp heat models available. Um, so the corrosion model I won't go through it in too much detail, but essentially we, we add an additional term which relates to the, the relative humidity, um, both during the testing and what it would be under normal operational conditions. And then there's additional fitting parameter, which is small n. Um, typically the sort of values we, we get for small n would be somewhere between two to four. Um, we, we calculated for OPVs in the past and it's around about 2.2. 2. 2. 2. Um, and I've seen in a, a paper in, in silicon that yeah, people recommend a, a value around about 2.7 for, for, for sort of bus bar corrosion. You can keep building these models up. Um, you can include in the influence of light or voltage using something known as the inverse power law. And this is a good indication of your acceleration factor for um, testing under elevated light conditions. And typically for, 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 for light exposures, we, we, we tend to find a value somewhere between 0.6 and 2.5. For, for APVs, we, we always found a value less than one, um, which, yeah. So I talked a lot about the equations, but there is you know, commercial software out there for, for calculating acceleration factors that are not too costly. And a lot of the companies give free trials as well. Um, we, we work very closely with, with one company who supplies Reliasoft um, based, based near Manchester, but there's a range of, range of companies providing software for this data fitting. Uh, we also use Minitab quite a lot for, for distribution fittings and and design of experiments as well. Um, so just fi finally finish up with this, this last slide, which shows um, some calculations we've we done on organic solar cells, not, not perovskite solar cells, but it's um, what we did uh, a few years ago was, was just look at these, um, these different ISOS test standards, and we tried to calculate the acceleration factors for all of these different standards. Um, in terms of our ISOS B standards, we, we see that um, acceleration factor goes up with the, the relative severity of the test, which is, is to be expected. I mean, our, our shelf life test is a, a D1 test, and you can see the acceleration factor is less than one. So if we do a shelf life test, then um, we, we're actually going to you know, reduce the degradation from what you might get outdoors. Um, and you can do the same for, for some of the light testing as well, and you can calculate acceleration factors for your light testing to um, in the case of the ISOS L3, we, we accelerate the degradation by, by 21 times if we do the ISOS L3 relative to our, our sort of climate in the UK. I didn't talk about it, but you can also do this for thermal cycling testing as well. So there's, there's a range of thermal cycle models you can use. Good. So, so just finally finish up with some acknowledgements to, to my team in Bangor um, and also to a few people around the UK and, and funders. So um, thank you to all of them. And yeah, many thanks for all of you for, for taking your time out to listen to me. And you know, should you have any questions, you're, you're welcome to email me on this, um, on, on this email address. You know, we're happy to collaborate and, and answer any questions. So, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, the questions start with Bjorn. First, one uh, small technical question. Okay. Uh, 
uh, if uh, someone needs uh, to access presentations or PPT files from today's seminar, I'm not sure it's going to be shared, but what will be shared is the recording of all of this event. It's going to be uh, set on YouTube channel and you can revisit it. Or you can shoot an email to Professor Kettle directly as he suggested and ask for the slides. So now uh, going back to questions to you, there is reoccurring in different shapes and forms question about UV light. Uh, in particular, like whether we can calculate some acceleration factor uh, associated with UV light uh, and decoupled somehow from the temperature increase. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think there'd be a way of doing it. Um, we, we've done it for something slightly different in the past, um, sort of an electrical test where, where you, we didn't want to overstress the device. Um, so there is a way, yeah, that there would be a way where we, you know, you, you need to be do, doing some light testing both with and without UV filters, but you could certainly build um, life test models with a UV filter and without a UV filter, um, and then see how that UV filter affects different at different irradiance levels. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, you know, the UV, UV side of, of perovskites is, is really really critical critical issue um you know it's clear that it's a it's a, it's a very important stress mechanism um you know, if you do testing underneath a sulfur plasma versus underneath a an led solar simulator you get, you get very very different characteristics you know, right. simply um because of that, that uv light component so there is a question from the panel here um, the question is whether you validate validate the models for perovskite solar cells um, but which which model do you mean? Uh, they predicted the acceleration factor. Um, no, we we haven't. Um, not not yet. Uh, so so the, the the data I used just for the Irenius was really just an example about how how you how you go about calculating it. Um, my, my you know this is this you know, the Irenius is a very very good example to use. Um, in the past, we've done a lot more sort of multi-stress testing. I suspect you get much much more accurate models, much much more easier to validate models if you looked at a, a more complex model, which included in um, damp heat and light testing as well. So I think if you used a model sort of more similar to that, you, you'll be able to validate it much more quickly, and it'll probably be much closer to the, the you know, your your experimental conditions. This is for future, but that's important, of course. Uh, there are questions about um, how how do you account for batch to batch variation? So if you if you are trying to do this, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, batch to batch variation is 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 a big issue in in um, reliability engineering. Um, ideally, before you start testing, you you want to have a what I'd say is a reasonable control about your processes so that you're not getting so much batch to batch variation. Um, so, I mean, it, it becomes a bit of a judgmental issue rather than, than, than mm -hmm. say, a scientific issue. You know, you, as part of any reliability test program, you'd want to ensure that you've got a, a good handle on your processes before starting reliability testing. Um, it really depends upon what, what state you are if you, if you want to be doing this testing early on. Um, yeah. But, Unfortunately, that's what we live with, and I guess increasing the sample size would always be beneficial. Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. S sample sets are, you know, it's good. you can do modeling of, of what the optimum sample set you, you want to do. Um, you could add in stuff like confidence levels to your, a lot of your predictions as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I, I think the one of the key messages, you know, you know is. You're not doing reliability testing once you once you finish your process development. You're doing it all at the same time, and um, it's one of those things you just have to plan into your testing. Is that there is some process variation as well? There are many other questions. I'm going to just quickly pick one or combine some uh, couple of questions to you, which are asking: Is there a reference or something where people can look? Uh, at pretty much the content of your talk uh, with regards to what are the acceleration factors at different ISOs procedures, etc. Um, yeah, we can, we can send through a link. We did it for OPVs a few years ago. Um, we haven't done it so much for perovskites, but we'd be, be very 
you know, if you're interested to actually try it at some stage. Um, but yeah, we could send through a link or yep. I don't know how, how best to do it. Maybe, maybe I can add it to the, the web chat in a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, okay. we did some work with the, the Krebs group sort of calculating the different acceleration factors, but yeah, we can certainly put on a, put on a link to the web chat in a second. Perfect, thanks a lot. And there are other questions, so if you can, in between, answer some of them, that would be great. And then thanks a lot. We should move to the uh, last but not least talk of today by Professor Francesca Brunetti, and she will share her experience and view on the round robin experience with Perovskite TV. Hi, everybody. So, Jeff, uh, if you uh, uh, stop sharing the screen, I can share mine. I'm trying to. Ah, thank you. Um, uh, so the windows actually. I'm really sorry. I don't know what's what's happened here. Is there any any any? Can you still see my screen? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh no, not. Now you're yeah. oh, yes. so good. So, yes. Okay, now you shall see my screen. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what I'm going to show uh, today is uh, like uh, some of uh, the result of uh, an interlaboratory uh, experiment that uh, we did, uh, like uh, starting uh, from uh, 2017. Uh, the background of this experiment uh, is uh, like uh, uh, placed uh, uh, within uh, um, a project uh, um, which was a cost action with the name Stable Next Sol that was uh, led by uh, Dr. Monica Liracantu. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, cost action uh, was uh, like uh, focused on the evaluation of the stability of new generation uh, photovoltaics. Uh, at the beginning, it was mainly focused on organic uh, uh, solar cell, but uh, since uh, during uh, the project, uh, the perovskite came to the scene, uh, then uh, we also added uh, an activity specifically uh, on uh, evaluation of perovskite degradation. Uh, this action uh, was uh, very successful uh, and in the last year uh, and it was involving uh, 36 countries uh, uh, and uh, uh, more than uh, four, 480 people, uh, which meant that uh, it was really uh, spread uh, and uh, was really, uh, let's say, um, involving uh, many, many of the people uh, working both uh, in organic and in uh, perovskite solar cell. Uh, what we did, uh, we did within uh, this uh, action uh, was uh, to organize uh, a, an interlaboratory experiment. Uh, this experiment uh, was uh, like uh, uh, quite long in the sense that needed uh, <laughs> quite a long time to be organized. We started in 2016 uh, and then uh, we, uh, we did uh, in reality the experiment uh, from 2017 to 2018. And uh, what, uh, what was uh, the goal? Like uh, to benefit uh, of the framework of the cost action uh, that uh, was uh, like involving many different uh, partners to uh, start to investigate uh, in detail uh, aging phenomena using uh, the ISOS protocol that were already there. And then uh, like with experience of this experiment uh, also like uh, to assess uh, new uh, possible uh, protocol. And and in fact, uh, let's say that uh, uh, within uh, this uh, uh, cost action, uh, as uh, also Eugene uh, uh, and Monica were uh, highlighting and also 
Park, then the discussion on how to measure uh, the stability for uh, uh, perovskite solar cells started. So uh, this experiment uh, was uh, like uh, involving uh, six different uh, production labs uh, and uh, also 10 different characterization lab. So the idea was uh, like to start uh, to share uh, samples uh, because uh, at that time uh, there were not so many like uh, lab already producing uh, uh, perovskite uh, solar cells and uh, like uh, to um, to share also the knowledge on how to measure those samples because at the time uh, when we started uh, it was still not clear uh, which were like the phenomena that were ongoing in the perovskite solar cell how to measure uh, like uh, for example uh, the different uh, uh, aging uh, effect and so uh, the idea was to start to share the knowledge on this uh, topic topic. Uh, what did uh, we choose to, uh, to do this experiment? Uh, we, we chose to uh, test uh, like uh, three uh, different architecture. Uh, so we studied, uh, um, uh, let's say, two uh, type of uh, uh, perovskite solar cell realized with uh, a mesoporous architecture uh, with a double and the MAPI as active layer. Then we were testing a planar architecture architecture uh, with MAPI and triple uh, cation uh, and also like a different uh, uh, electron transporting layer and then uh, we were also testing a mesoporous carbon solar cell. So the participation to this experiment was based uh, uh, let's say on a, a volunteering uh, uh, on volunteering so uh, like uh, the laboratory were providing uh, the type of architecture that they were uh, more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, reliable uh, to uh, realize. And then uh, we were uh, doing uh, several aging testing on uh, all uh, the different architectures. Starting from uh, the mesoporus, uh, what uh, we were testing uh, first uh, was uh, the D1, uh, and uh, the D1 is uh, testing dark in ambient condition, uh, and the, um, as you see uh, from the slide, uh, both the MAPI and the double cation were stable over uh, 1,000 uh, hour, actually 1,200 hour, so there was no substance aging for both the cell. The big difference between the two devices was that in the case of the MAPI a bigger hysteresis could be uh, uh, detected and this uh, is now a well-known uh, phenomena that uh, is um, observed in literature but at the time it was like uh, let's say starting uh, uh, starting this type of measurement on these devices. Uh, same devices uh, were uh, aged under uh, L1 protocol. In this case, uh, the, the devices were uh, aged uh, using a, a, a white LED array uh, source. And uh, as you see, um, different uh, testing conditions were considered. In particular, for uh, the double cation, the aging at maximum power point and at VOC was uh, considered. And as you see, uh, like uh, as uh, it is already reported in uh, literature, like uh, the VOC represent the uh, testing condition uh, which is uh, more affecting uh, the uh, lifetime of uh, our device. And so uh, what we could observe was that uh, considering uh, like the double cation, just one hour and a half was the duration of the device under, under uh, continuous illumination, uh, considering uh, testing at VOC while uh, a maximum power point, the device was lasting uh, over 14 hours. 
the interesting uh, activity that was done uh, during uh, uh, this experiment was to uh, test uh, the devices in outdoor condition. Um, these, uh, these tests were done in, the, um, in particular in Barcelona and uh, uh, the device uh, were uh, in this case uh, measured under uh, outdoor uh, illumination considering a sweep rate of 20 millivolt per second and the bot forward and reverse uh, characterization was, uh, was uh, considered. Uh, as you see uh, here in the slide, uh, like uh, the, um, the device had uh, a different uh, active area. This was uh, one of the uh, starting uh, point of uh, this uh, uh, interlaboratory study because we were trying uh, like uh, to define a common uh, architecture for all the labs but uh, it was uh, uh, turning out that it was difficult uh, for all the lab to standardize uh, their uh, the device uh, focusing on a single architecture so at the end we could uh, in a way adapt the measurement system uh, to all the different architecture that uh, were uh, considered here you can uh, see the outdoor, uh, the outdoor characterization of the two devices. Uh, interesting, uh, in the case of the MAPI, uh, there is a rather oscillation in the efficiency uh, like uh, that uh, goes uh, <coughs> up and down around uh, what is called the T80 calculated respect to the maximum uh, efficiency achieved uh, for uh, these devices uh, and uh, like uh, that uh, finally goes under uh, uh, this uh, uh, T80 uh, just after uh, 288 hours. In the case of the double cation, the uh, degradation is uh, like uh, uh, more uh, um, continuous so that we don't see uh, as much as in the case of the MAPI uh, this uh, oscillation in, uh, uh, in the degradation uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this can be due to the fact that uh, MAPI is uh, more affected by this recovery uh, effect of the uh, solar cell that uh, can be seen like uh, in uh, that has been seen in several uh, in several uh, devices also present in literature. Uh, similar characterization uh, was done on uh, carbon-based uh, devices. In this case, uh, uh, there were five labs involved. So uh, the device uh, in this case were produced only in, the say in one lab and then sent to be characterized in uh, the other uh, four uh, labs. Uh, here you can see the images of the device that were characterized. And uh, uh, in this slide, uh, you can see like the uh, summary of the results uh, obtained considering the, this uh, car carbon cell, <coughs> like um, considering, uh, considering the dark behavior, uh, the device were lasting more than 1000 hours, but uh, at ambient and uh, at 65 degrees. When considering uh, the uh, illumination, the effect of illumination, like uh, the degradation was uh, very fast when considering uh, an aging in uh, open circuit uh, uh, condition. Instead, also in this case, uh, when uh, considering the device under maximum power point, a condition uh, that the T80 could uh, be achieved uh, at uh, 79 hour. Uh, interesting uh, for this type of devices uh, when doing uh, the JD scan like there was uh, always uh, a, a drop after uh, each characterization of the devices and this, uh, uh, this is something which has been reported uh, for the carbon solar cell that is uh, due to the fact that this type of devices has a slower response under illumination. 
Considering outdoor stability test, uh, these devices have been uh, tested in two different uh, uh, places uh, in uh, Malta and um, in uh, Spain. And uh, um, what we can notice uh, is that. Uh, as in the, in the other case of mesoporous solar cell, uh, the outdoor operation was over 30 days, so uh, demonstrating the fact that the uh, light um, uh, the, um, the L1 test is much more harsh than the condition when the device normally works outdoor. If we go down in detail, uh, comparing like the behavior of uh, some of the cycle of uh, the uh, carbon and the double cation solar cell, what we see is that during uh, like uh, uh, those are three days of illumination where the behavior of the two devices are compared, we see that while in the case of the standard uh, double cation Porous, uh, we have uh, like an efficiency that is uh, dependent uh, on the on the illumination uh, which uh, follows uh, in a way like the short circuit uh, current. In the case of the carbon uh, we have uh, when uh, there is uh, the maximum illumination uh, like uh, uh, very uh, uh, an efficiency which is decreased with respect to when there is uh, a low illumination and uh, this is uh, like uh, um, this is uh, something that we observe also in the field factor and uh, is due to the fact that in case of a carbon cell the electrode is not gold and this carbon so it's less conductive so what you get is like a more resistive effect when there is more current uh, in, uh, in the device, so under uh, uh, like high illumination, and therefore there is a decrease of the field factor which affects the efficiency. Also for a planar solar cell, uh, similar uh, characterization uh, were done. In this case, the study took, uh, let's say, uh, a different direction. Those are the two architectures that, that were tested. In, a, in the case of the device prepared at TNO, you know, they were cell, while the one prepared at IMEC were modules. And uh, again, uh, here we see uh, same story under uh, light soaking, uh, the solar cell, uh, lose uh, their uh, starting efficiency very start very fast but uh, what was observed and this uh, was a work that was done uh, like uh, the Ben Gurion uh, University, the outdoor measurement, uh, and uh, this uh, this paper was uh, like uh, uh, led uh, was uh, was written by Mark and uh, Professor Eugene Katz in the analysis of the data. Um, here, uh, what you see is that if you consider the behavior of uh, the solar cell during uh, the alternation of day and night, there is uh, like uh, a uh, um, there are two different possible behavior. One behavior is the one when you recover, like during the night, the efficiency in a way, and then you go down again, and then at some point you grow, you cross, uh, like so you cross many times the T80 if you normalize respect to the standard efficiency until at some point you finally go below to this value. In the second, in the second type of device, uh, so in this case we have a kind of recovery uh, after resting in the night. In the second uh, case, what you see instead is that during the exposition of uh, like the uh, device under uh, the sun, like the uh, efficiency tend to increase and then decreases during uh, the night. So there is uh, what is called the fatigue-like behavior. So what was uh, like uh, the question that was uh, uh, that uh, at the time uh, we tried to answer was to uh, how to evaluate uh, in reality this uh, T80 uh, and uh, in the case of uh, the, um, the work uh, done in this, uh, uh, for this activity, uh, the evaluation proposed was uh, based actually on the energy 
that uh, was like produced by the devices uh, during the, the day and then uh, uh, defining the T80 uh, the moment uh, when the uh, energy produced by the device uh, goes uh, below the 80% of the starting energy of uh, the device allowing in this way to evaluate, let's say, instead of the uh, efficiency performance, the uh, uh, energy production uh, performance. So concluding uh, uh, this uh, presentation on, this, uh, on the result given to the, from this uh, round robin, uh, what, uh, what we were doing was to try to organize uh, an experiment to involve as many laboratories as uh, was possible at the time to share the knowledge on how to uh, build and how, especially how to characterize perovskite uh, solar cell. Uh, outdoor tests uh, were giving very interesting uh, results and some of them are still under, uh, under evaluation for a possible publication. And uh, this experience was very interesting because uh, it was like teaching us uh, how to uh, share knowledge and device and how to adapt uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, in a way, um, to adapt our uh, characterization system to sample that were not coming uh, directly from the, uh, the lab. And it was a great occasion to, uh, uh, to let's say, uh, give a contribution to the topic of stability of perovskite solar cell. So the acknowledge those are, uh, uh, I think, all the people involved in this experiment. If I miss somebody, maybe <laughs> I will get a me an email uh, this afternoon. I thank, of course, all the people uh, there in this, uh, in this uh, text. Thank you for your attention. And this is uh, my email in case you want to contact me. Thank you very much, Francesca, for this very interesting talk. And just like you did, our uh, panelists also expressed in the chat between panelists that they are very willing to answer to some of the questions by email. So do not hesitate to contact after this conference by email, but also the questions which, are, uh, which haven't been addressed here are going to be answered and written and published on the ICN2 website. So uh, uh, now uh, going to the questions which were asked to you. Uh, there is a question, that I'm not sure if it's particularly uh, in your talk, but it's, it's really important. People are asking about toxicity and what is your take between different devices which you show? What are less toxic, more toxic? Do you have any environmental friendly devices in there? Uh, no, so uh, these, uh, these were uh, like uh, devices, uh, uh, let's call it the first generation perovskite where there was uh, still a lead. Uh, there were no lead free uh, perovskite at that time for this uh, round robin and they actually it would be very interesting to to do other of these uh, studies because uh, and on other architectures and maybe like lead free devices because that could assess also like uh, their stability you know, like a, a more uh, uh, let's say a, using like this approach of involving uh, several labs well, uh, yeah true probably there is another question from the completely different angle. Uh, the uh, anonymous speaker asked if uh, change of the season can be accounted uh, in the evaluations of the outdoor data which you showed. Into yeah, uh, so of course it does uh, because uh, the temperature changes uh, and also like uh, the, um, the weather conditions uh, uh, so, uh, according to the temperature, Jeff was uh, saying, uh, was uh, showing like uh, that uh, different temperature affect the device uh, and the type of device differently. And so, like, um, this uh, can affect 
affect the outdoor measurement and also like if it's uh, rainy or not but this is more like related to the encapsulation what i have to say like uh, linking uh, to the um, to the talk of wrong wrong is that uh, if you have a very good encapsulation then uh, for example uh, like the problem with the water shall be like uh, not so complex uh, uh, to to handle but uh, still temperature uh, uh, like uh, affects uh, the behavior of the devices okay there is another question asking uh, if you can generalize on what is your take in lesson from comparing stability indoor and outdoor yeah so uh, the lesson learned is that uh, uh, maybe uh, when we do indoor uh, maybe we stress too much our devices and uh, so uh, as Jeff uh, uh, was showing we have then to understand how much that this uh, like can be uh, related to like real uh, working condition um, and uh, like because because especially with perskite we have this strange uh, behavior which are also different from device to device so some some are like recovering after the night some are not so i mean uh, it's uh, the the message is that uh, like it's very very important to work with outdoor testing to really validate uh, the the technology I couldn't agree more with you. I'm also joined by the outdoor testing. I know, Mark. <laughs> it's, very it's very important. And uh, there is a, a comment which, which I also agree in here, but we are using slant when we are saying indoor tests, of course. <laughs> we are using it as just the opposite to the outdoor, but of course, indoor tests, which are specific for indoor applications, are very different from indoor tests we are talking about. Uh, yeah, of course. So actually, if we speak about the indoor application, it's another word. Like, uh, so that's that's true. Yeah, <laughs> true, but yeah. And another question by Giorgio Bardiza is that it seems that irradiance uh, is more uh, important for the device lifetime rather than uh, the temperature in your outdoor data. Is it correct or is it yeah, so, yeah, you mean, so if you mean uh, this one, so the temperature uh, is uh, oscillating, uh, if we see on the long, uh, on the long run, the temperature uh, is uh, oscillating between uh, like uh, 23, and 50, 25, 50 degrees. Um, and so in this data, uh, like uh, the efficiency is uh, like shown just uh, at one sun. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, like uh, there is uh, an aging uh, a long time for, uh, for uh, the devices. I don't know if uh, this was uh, the, uh, the the graph that was mentioned or the other maybe not sure either i'm, I'm like checking that's very difficult to decouple the effect of radiance and yeah, exactly just by looking because, at them uh, because i mean they are completely related i would say because the temperature like yeah yeah okay so just to keep us uh, with this stay at home seminar we mean the time frame which we have uh, I suggest that the rest of the questions we will go through all, all the speakers uh, later on and we will uh, try to answer our best. Also, uh, this uh, meeting has been recorded and since all the speakers uh, agreed to share this recording, it's going to be published on the YouTube channel by ICN2. And uh, uh, you're free to go and check that. And uh, in particular, you can check the email addresses of the speakers and we are all open. Uh, to communicate with her with you. Uh, I don't know if uh, Monica and Eugene want to say a couple of words. Yes, please do so. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. Well, uh, first, I, I want to thank you, all of you, the panelists, for, I mean, Mark, Conrad, Ron, Ron, um, Jeff, and Francesca, for very, very nice and interesting talks. Uh, it's very interesting, very nice to be able to have all, access to all this information that is a state of the art, the stability of, of solar cells. I also want to thank you, to thank Eugene, Hi, Bing, Mark, the organizers of this webinar. And of course, I don't want to forgive, uh, forget, I'm sorry, Alex Argemi, who is the, the, the responsible for the organization of these stay at home semi webinars here at NIC and two uh, in my institute. And I hope that, um, that people, and this, especially postdocs and students, realize how, how important these webinars are now that we are confined at home. And, um, Please uh, organize more seminars for, for all the audience. I, I hope you like it. I think it's a very, very interesting uh, way of doing it for 15 minutes and five minutes of questions because it's very active. Uh, and for me, that's all. I hope everybody is, is fine at home and uh, stay safe. I, I hope to see you again in the next Stay at Home webinar of ICN2. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Eugene. Yeah, bye bye, Monica. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks to everyone.